Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. And we read it, verse 6. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. I've spent the last two Sundays demonstrating to you the fulfillment of that prophecy. The desire of all nations shall come. That desire of all nations being the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is specifically fulfilled in His first coming, though it will have another fulfillment at His second coming, which we today desire and look forward to. But having identified that, I'm ready now to look at the prophecies that surround it. And we want to particularly concentrate on the one there in verse 6 about the shaking of the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and all nations in connection with the coming of the desire of all nations. Now, I freely admit to you that we're going to be digging deeper into the Word of God today. Uh, This is not one of the easier things to expound, and you're going to have to stay with me and follow me to get what we're saying here. And I'm going to be very honest with you. I have a concern when I dig into the deeper things of how many people are even going to be able to follow me. I fear people's minds are so weakened and dulled by TV and sports and digital distractions and trivia that their powers of concentration are so compromised that to dig deeper into things like this, it doesn't take much and you're, you're beyond them. Now, of course, I'm using a little reverse psychology when I tell you that, hoping that that will spur you to make an extra effort. And then when I look at a passage like this, I, I'm very, it, it's a passion of mine to always make everything I preach relevant to where you are right now and what you deal with right now. And I want to do that with this passage. However, this extends way beyond our puny little lives. Because what this verse is letting us know is that the coming of Jesus Christ, the desire of all nations and the desire of our souls, would be a cataclysmic event. It would literally alter the course of human history. It would shake the entire universe. And I want to break that down and show you that indeed that is what happened when Jesus came. And that having happened only confirms to us the fact that the desire of all nations has come in fulfillment of this prophecy. And one of the things that I think is of most practical value is it confirms to us the reality, the truth of our holy religion. And that we have the church of the living God. Again, the coming of Christ in the world was a cataclysmic event. Now, we often refer to major changes as shake-ups. In fact, according to Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, uh, a shake-up is defined as an extensive and often, often drastic reorganization. And that's exactly what happened when Christ came. There was a drastic reorganization in the church, but in the world at large as well. Drastic and extensive. And another thing is when you're looking at the definition of the word shake, it means to agitate. In fact, I think the word for shake in French is agite. It'll tell you to agite something in order to shake it up before you use it. Agite, uh, to, um, let me get back into English. To means to agitate. I'm starting to give it a French pronunciation. The word shake means to agitate. And when you look at the word trouble in the Bible, you'll find that one of the definitions, primary meanings of that word is to agitate. So, to be shaken can mean to be troubled. Now, I'm going to come back to that. You'll see, if we get there, why that particular aspect of the definition is relevant to this study. So, just put that back in your head, that the word shake, embodied in its primary meaning, can mean to trouble. And uh, that's not all, but it's, it's, it's in there. And like I say, I'll have reason to point that out as we move forward. Now, we first of all want to zero in on this. Yet once, it is a little while. This indicates that it was not going to be long 
before this prophecy of the coming of the desire of all nations would be fulfilled. Now, the prophecy of Haggai was written about 520 to 519 B.C., about 500 years before the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, the Messiah had been promised from the beginning of the world. We read the first promise of it in Genesis 3.15 to Adam and Eve. And so, the Messiah had been promised from the beginning of the world, which at this point in history, at the time Haggai wrote, means that 3,500 years of human history had transpired. And Messiah came around 4,000 years after the beginning of the world. So when you take the fact that this is written about 520 to 519 B.C., 3,500 years have transpired before the actual coming of Messiah, 4,000 years after the beginning of the world, this lets us know that 87.5% of the time had elapsed from creation to the fulfillment of this prophecy. 87.5% of the time elapsed from creation to the prophecy of Haggai, which means there was only about 12.5% of the time remaining before Messiah came. Now, when you're speaking comparatively, 12.5% is just a little while. If you think of it comparatively, 87.5% versus 12.5%, that's just a little while of time left, and Messiah would make his appearance. Now, one of the things that I've taught you in the past, and don't forget this, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. We are taught to compare Scripture with Scripture. And this is one passage of Scripture that is commented on in the New Testament. We get a commentary, Paul's commentary, on this passage in the book of Hebrews, and it'll help us to understand what's embodied in this great shake-up that would take place in connection with the coming of Messiah. So we want to come over to the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and and look at this passage in relation to what we're considering. And I'm going to start reading here in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse uh, 25. See then that ye refuse not him that speaketh. That's talking about Jesus Christ, by the way. For if they escape, and I'll come back to that why I say that. For if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth, which was Moses, giving the law, much more shall, we not, shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, which is Jesus Christ. So what he's doing here, he's contrasting Moses who spoke on earth and Jesus Christ who speaks from heaven. And one of the grand themes, overriding themes of the book of Hebrews is to show the superiority of the ministry of Jesus Christ over the superiority of Moses. The superiority of the New Testament over the Old Testament. And bear in mind this was written to Hebrews because this was very radical. The Hebrews were abandoning the way of worship that had been the tradition of their families for thousands of years for something new and radical and different. And what Paul does in the book of Hebrews is he shows them from their own Old Testament scriptures that this change in the system of religion had been prophesied and set forth. But anyway, that's, that's, that's a, an entirely different subject. I don't want to get too off on that. Just to show you that he's drawing a contrast between Moses and Jesus Christ. Now, speaking of Moses, or speaking the, of, the, of the voice of God, whose voice then shook the earth. Now, bear in mind, shook the earth. And I'm going to show you when that happened. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, which means he will shake the earth. And I'll show you that. But that's not the only thing that's going to be shaken, but also heaven. So there will be a shaking of heaven and earth. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken. And this is going to help us identify what he's talking about. As of those things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now let's draw a conclusion. Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Man, there's a lot of preaching in that. Let's break that down. Again, Haggai is, what what Paul is letting us know that Haggai, uh, from Haggai, is that there's a contrast between the law of Moses, the Old Testament, 
and Christ, the mediator of the New Testament. Now, he identifies this guy that spoke on earth, and he's talking there about Moses. And in the context of the discussion, he's already been mentioning the ministry of Moses. Go back up to verse 18 in Hebrews uh, 12, and you'll see that Moses is the one he's talking to when he says he spake on earth. He says, you're not coming to the mount which might be touched, that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. And this is the way Mount Sinai appeared when God came down and he gave the law to Moses. The mount was burning, it was on fire, covered over with smoke, there was darkness, blackness, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. It scared them so badly. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. This refers to the giving of the law at Mount Sinai to Moses. And Moses is going to be particularly that one that Paul is talking about when he said he he spake on earth, on earth. Now, first of all, I want to point out that when the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, there was a shaking of the earth. Haggai says there's coming a time when the earth will be shaken again, but more, heaven will be shaken. But under Moses, the earth was shaken. And that literally happened. Let me show you that. Come over to the book of Exodus 19. This is called Bible study, people. We're going to be digging around in here to figure this all out. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse uh, 18, we're going to see that when God gave the law on Mount Sinai to Moses, the earth quaked. There was a shaking of the earth. We read in Exodus 19, 18, Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked. Watch it now. Believe what the Bible tells you greatly. This was not some little tremor. I mean, this one probably was right up there on the Richter scale. The mount quaked greatly. God shook the earth when he gave the law to Moses. This was an earth-shaking event. One of the greatest events that ever occurred in history. And God signaled that by shaking the earth at that time. Does that make the Ten Commandments important, people? I think it does. I think it does. Now, let me give you one other verse to line up with that on the shaking of the earth at the giving of the law of Moses. Come over to Judges chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. And he's describing here when God came down, descended down on Mount Sinai. And it's interesting to look at the way God described this. In Judges 5, 4 and 5, Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, which is another name for the nation of Edom, they dwelt in the area of Mount Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled. See, there's the earthquake. The heavens dropped, the clouds also dropped water. So I think in connection with God giving the law on Mount Sinai, there was a a huge torrential rainstorm. The mountains melted before, before the Lord. I think there were landslides and rocks falling. I mean, this was a great earthquake. And so the mountains melted from before the Lord. Even, he's going to describe the mountain, even that Sinai from before the Lord, the God of Israel. So I have cited that second passage just to drive home the fact that when God gave the law, there was a major earthquake. But now, before I leave that, let me just answer a question that might be in your mind. He's definitely talking about what happened at Mount Sinai and the big earthquake that took place at that time. But what's this deal about God coming out of Seir and marching out of the field of Edom? Well, if you look on a Bible map and you locate where Mount Sinai is, you will see that Mount Seir and the nation of Edom is north of Sinai. Now, one of the things that our Bible teaches us is God's throne is located in what direction? Hmm? The north. God's throne is in the north. And so for God to descend from his throne and come down to Mount Sinai, he would come from the north moving southward, which would have him coming right through Edom and Mount Seir. Isn't that neat? 
Isn't that but you see, this is what we get from studying the Bible and digging around and comparing verses with verses. So here God makes the northward descent down to Mount Sinai. And I mean, the mountain ranges are melting. The mount is quaking greatly. God is shaking the earth. But Haggai promises that yet once more, God will shake not the earth only, but heaven also. So, but we'll see he shook the earth with the coming of the desire of all nations and shook more than that. But before I do that, there's a practical, there's a couple of things I want to draw out of Hebrews 12 that I think are very important practical points. Get it where the rubber meets the road. In Hebrews chapter 12, we go back to our commentary on Haggai. Chapter 12, he gives this admonition in verse 35, See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth. That's Moses. Those that refused the ministry of Moses did not escape. Right while you're in the book of Hebrews, flip over, keep your finger there because I'll be back. Come over to chapter 2 and verse 2. This is talking about the law of Moses. And he says in verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels, and God utilized angels to deliver the law to Moses, that can be shown from other places as well. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, which is what Paul is teaching again in Hebrews 12. If they didn't escape... When they didn't listen to Moses, how are you and I going to escape if we don't listen to the greater than Moses, who is the Lord Jesus Christ? And they did not escape. All you have to do is read your Old Testament after the giving of the law of Moses, and you will discover that every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. I mean serious stuff. And we could just preach and preach and just read Deuteronomy 29. And you'll get an idea of the kind of recompense that people received when they refused him that spake on earth. But now Jesus Christ is put in contrast and described as him that speaketh from heaven. Let me show you how he, why, where this contrast comes in. It's pretty exciting. And actually the main argument isn't even in the notes. I just thought of it after I typed the outline and I'll throw it in for good measure. But come over to John chapter 3 and let's see why Jesus is described as him that speaketh from heaven as opposed to Moses who spake on earth. You'll see the difference. In John 3, 31 to 32, he that cometh from above is above all. Jesus Christ is different from every man on this earth in that he came down from heaven We all started down here. He started up there, came down and became one of us. But his ministry started up there. He that cometh from above is above all, including Moses. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. Stay in John 3 and let me couple that with John 17, 8. And we will see that Jesus Christ came down from heaven and delivered his word. So that it is said he speaks from heaven. He speaks from heaven. John 17, 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. They know that this message came from God through me. I came down from heaven, the one from heaven, and delivered this word. But how is it that it says, while he's on earth speaking, he speaketh from heaven? Go back to John 3. This this clenches it. This sets Jesus Christ apart from Moses and lets us know why Jesus Christ is described as the one that's speaking from heaven, whereas Moses is merely speaking from earth. They both got their message from God. No question about that. They both did. But there is a way that when Jesus Christ spoke, it was different than when Moses spoke because of who he was. As you will see in John chapter 3 and verse 13. 
Jesus said, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. See, Moses didn't come down from heaven. Jesus did. But watch. Even the Son of Man, hold it now, which is in heaven, which, by the way, that's been deleted from the modern translations. Isn't that awful? Here's Jesus Christ standing on earth, talking to these people on earth, just like I'm talking to you right now. And he says, no man ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. But then he says, even the Son of Man, which, notice he said, is in heaven, not was in heaven, but is in heaven. Jesus Christ is not just a man, he's God. Which means while he was standing there on earth, in his divine nature, he was still in heaven. He was on heaven, he was in heaven, he was on earth. And so when this man was speaking to you on earth, that was God speaking from heaven. See the difference? Do you see the difference? Moses could never lay claim to that. Moses is not God in heaven while he's speaking to people on earth, but Jesus Christ is. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. That shows me a big difference between Jesus and Moses. So that's why he says he speaketh from heaven, even though he's speaking on the earth. He's speaking from heaven. He came from heaven, unlike Moses, and was still in heaven while he was here, unlike Moses. So everything he said was a voice from heaven and not just a voice sounding on this earth. But one thing I would have you to notice in this passage, he said, See not that ye refuse him that speaketh. That's present tense. For if they escape not, if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. When I'm giving you the words of Jesus Christ in this book, he's still speaking. He's speaking to you from heaven. I preach this gospel to you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Christ is speaking to you now. And if they did not, and I'm not saying I'm Christ, I'm just an ambassador, I'm just a mouthpiece. It's his word that I'm delivering you. That's what's speaking from heaven. And you refuse that, you will not escape. If they didn't escape who refused him that spake on earth, you will not refuse him that speaketh. You will not escape if you refuse him that speaketh from heaven. The words that he spoke still are just as fresh in their authority and power as when they were first uttered. It's amazing. In Acts chapter 3, 22 and 23, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Meaning you'll listen to Jesus Christ. And it shall come to pass that every soul that will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Now, that lets you know there'll be no escaping if we neglect the words of Jesus Christ. I strongly urge everybody to heed the commandments of Jesus Christ. Because if you refuse what Jesus Christ tells you to do, you will not escape. Absolutely you will not. There will be a consequence in time if you're a child of God and eternity if you're not. I advise you listen to the Son of God. All right, now go back to Hebrews 13. Look at verse 26. Speaking of God's voice then shook the earth. But now with the promise saying yet once more, I shake not the earth only. And, I'm, and that which implies he did shake the earth when Jesus came. I'm going to show you that in a minute if you stay with me. But he didn't just shake the earth. He shook heaven. But Paul's going to make a specific application of these words we must look at. He says, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised saying yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of those things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken remain, may remain, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace. Paul is applying this prophecy. And this, if you can stay with me, this really gets good. I, I won't finish it today, but it really is fascinating to me. But Paul applies this prophecy 
to the removing of the Mosaic order of service that the Jews had been observing for, well, ever since the delivery of the law of Moses unto this time. The removal of the Mosaic order of service, I think it had been about, oh gosh, what was it? About, uh, how many years? I'm trying to think of when, when was the Exodus about what time? Okay, okay, so this had been close to uh, b- b- about 2,500 years they'd been doing this, if I've got my figures right. I don't like to do mathematical equations under pressure because that's not my strong suit. Sorry, give me a language to learn and I can learn it. Numbers and I'll let somebody else take care of that. So anyway, Paul applies this prophecy to the removal, thank you Conrad, to the removal of the Mosaic order of service and the establishing of Christianity. You know what this is telling us? That the establishing of Christianity was a universal shaking event. Well, we'll we'll elaborate on that as we go on. But, But specifically, Paul is applying it to the removal of the Old Testament system, the setting aside of Moses' law and the order of service under that law. He is applying it to that and showing how greatly that single event impacted the entire universe. Isn't it amazing, people, and this is what gets me, how God orders the affairs of the entire universe to revolve around his church. He did it in the Old Testament. And when there was a big shakeup and change in the organization of the church, he shook everything else up with it. That makes what we're part of, people, important. There's the practical value of this. You have the, I, the one thing that the man that baptized me sometimes when he would preach and he had a very shrill voice and he'd really project and once in a while he'd just stop and he'd say, we have the church of the living God. Just he was so moved by the realization of that and amen to what he said and peace to his ashes. His brother Labrosco Burke, the man that baptized me, Conrad knew him. All right. So, but, and one of the ways we know that this is talking about the mosaic order of things is when he says, let me read verse 27. Yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of those things that are made. The whole system of worship under Moses' law was full of stuff made by the hands of man. Go back to Hebrews 9. Let me prove this to you. Let me prove this to you. Hebrews chapter 9. We go through all these deep things and then I love it when we can come up and surface and make a, make a profound point that's so relevant to where we are today. In Hebrews 1, 9, 1, for verily the first covenant, this is talking about the Old Testament. You read your Old Testament and about the tabernacle and the temple and all the sacrifices and the priesthood and all that rigmarole. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in the world, a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, get that word, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread which was called the sanctuary. All those things were made. And after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about them with gold. Those were made. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded in the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests always went into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now stay with me now. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, watch it now, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation, Watch it now. But Christ being calm and high priest of good things to come, but watch it, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. What does that tell you about that first tabernacle and its service? It was made with hands. That is not to say of this building. Neither by the blood of goats and cows, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. 
And then, then go on down and look at verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places, watch it, made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now take those passages and plug them back into Hebrews 12, 27. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of those things that are made. He's talking about the removal of the mosaic system that consisted in a system of worship made with hands. And in its place, what do we have? A kingdom which cannot be moved. And that's talking about the church of Jesus Christ, which we have in its New Testament form, which is not made with hands. Think about this church. This building is not the church. We are. We're not made with hands. Not man's hands. Our souls and spirits are not made with hands. And our worship goes beyond this building into the holiest of all, into the tabernacle that's in heaven where God is, the building that's not made with hands. We have no veil between. Our worship goes directly to Him. Wow. (laughs) So we've received a kingdom which cannot be moved. And when Jesus Christ set up the church in this earth, granted local churches come and go, live and die, but the institution of the church remains and it will remain till Jesus comes again. It will not be set aside as was the Mosaic order. It will go right on into eternity. Let me give you the verses. I make those statements, but I need to prove them with Bible verses. So you're not taking my word for it because it's not the word of Ben Mott that speaketh. It's the word of him that speaketh from heaven that has the consequences. So we must give you his word. In Matthew 16, 18 and 19. 16, 18 and 19. Jesus is talking to Peter and he says, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter... And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Sounds like an indestructible institution, isn't it? You know what hell is? Hell is the place of destruction. If the gates of hell do not prevail against it, it's an indestructible institution. It's a kingdom that cannot be moved. As was the temple. The temple was destroyed. It was moved. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Notice the word and connecting verse 19 with verse 18 that lets us know that the church is the kingdom of heaven. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Then come to Daniel 2.44. Daniel chapter 2, an amazing prophecy. We've preached about this before. The king of Babylon has a dream and he sees this huge colossus with a head of gold and chest and arms of silver and a belly of uh, uh, brass and then uh, legs and feet of iron in brass or iron and uh, legs of iron, pardon me. And he sees and, and Daniel lets him know that this Colossus represents four successive world empires and he gives us the first one. It was the one that was in existence at the time Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. It was the Babylonian Empire. He said, you're the head of gold. And we know, and we can trace this out in our Bible, this is Bible history will confirm this, that after Babylon, what empire came next? Anybody know? Persia, Persia, Medo-Persia. After Medo-Persia, what empire came next? Greece. Greece. And after Greece, what empire came next? Rome. So this brings us down to the bottom of the Colossus and the kingdom of Rome, the Roman kings. You come over to the book of Luke. Well, let me read verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, a kingdom which cannot be moved, and a kingdom which shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. Wow. Whatever this kingdom is, it's going to have a cataclysmic effect on the world empires. Wow. Wow. 
And we're going to see the establishing of Christianity in this earth had exactly that effect. Give you a sneak preview. He gives you this list of four world empires bringing down to Rome. Christianity is established. And what happens to Rome after that? Huh? Rome is destroyed. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. It will not be moved. And you come over to Luke chapter 3, and he gives you a time frame that lets you know you are right in the days of the Roman kings. And right there in those days, John the Baptist comes preaching in the wilderness, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, fulfilling Daniel 2.44. Wow indestructible institution. John starts baptizing people. Why do you suppose that is? Because that's how you enter the kingdom. That's how you get in the church. And then Ephesians 3.21 to show the church being an indestructible institution. Like I say, local churches, individual local churches come and go. They come and go. But the institution stays and will stay somewhere on this earth. It might be very small, but it's going to be here. And God give me grace and help me wherever it is. That's where I want to be. Ephesians 3, 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. That sounds indestructible, doesn't it? World without end. Amen. That sounds like a kingdom that fits what Daniel said that will be forever. A kingdom that cannot be removed. That's what we've received. So let us have grace and serve God with godly fear. Now go to Hebrews 10. And the thing you're going to notice about this kingdom that we've received, this order of service, the New Testament form of the church, which we have, we're going to see that this church, its service is mediated by the high priest in heaven rather than an earthly priest in a temple made with hands. And the church will never be removed as the Old Testament temple was. These are the things that cannot be shaken. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. I mean, right into the holy of holies, right where the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God is. To enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath... See, this is all new. There's been a big shakeup. Things have changed. There's been a reorganization by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, and we do. And our high priest over the house of God is not some guy right. serving up bread and wine on an altar. And it's not a pope in Rome. Our high priest is Jesus Christ, the right hand of God, that takes our pitiful worship and washes it, purifies it, perfects it, and presents it to God. We have a high priest over this house. Think about that, people. You come to church this morning. There's a high priest over this house. His name is Jesus. Let us draw near. That's what we're doing this morning. With a true heart and full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. See, we've been regenerated. We've been baptized. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he's faithful that promised And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. I think it's amazing how he introduces the subject of a new and living way and moves from that right into the assembly. See, you suppose there's a reason for that? I suggest that this is all part of that new and living way. This is that kingdom which we have received that cannot be shaken. But along with the dismantling of the Mosaic system was also the dismantling of Satan's program of one world empire that had been in effect. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Bam! But I have more for that later. Get to that later. Now let's go back to Hebrews 12 and pick up this point. Haggai prophesied that God would shake the earth and the sea and the dry land, but he also prophesied he'd shake heaven and all nations. Shake heaven. But what I want to zero in is the fact that he says he shook not the earth only, but also heaven. But that little expression, shook not the earth only, lets us know that with the coming of the desire of all nations, the earth shook. 
It did shake, and I'm going to show you that. And, and this is something that if you've read in the Gospels and read the crucifixion, you've read it. But you probably haven't given it a lot of thought. Well, I hope to change that today. I hope now when you go and you read about the crucifixion of our Lord and His resurrection, as we shall show, and you read these words, they'll take on a whole new <coughs> significance to you that maybe they never did in the past. That with the coming of the desire of all nations, this earth, this terra firma, literally shook. I will shake the earth, said God. There was a shaking of the earth before at Mount Sinai. We read that. Big earthquake. Great earthquake. But this lets us know God's going to do it once more. And indeed he did. Come over to Matthew chapter 27 and verse 51. Matthew 27 and verse 51. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. See, we no longer are barred out from the holiest by the veil. Our worship goes directly into heaven itself. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Watch it. And the earth did quake. Behold, I will shake the earth. And the rocks rent. I mean, again, we're not talking about just a minor tremor. We're talking about an earthquake big enough to split rocks. The earth quaked. There's an old hymn. I looked over it this morning. I wish it were in our hymnal. The cross of Christ inspires my heart to sing redeeming grace. And there's a line in that hymn that says, All nature felt the dreadful shock when Jesus died for me. (laughs) Let that sink in. All nature felt the dreadful shock when Jesus died for me. Shall the rocks rend? Shall the earth quake? And I remain indifferent and numb to the fact that Jesus died for me? That wasn't the only one. Come over to Matthew chapter 28. This might be another shaking of the earth that you overlooked or read right through it and it didn't really hit you what it was saying. In Matthew 28, 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Again, people, this is not some minor tremor. This is a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The two most significant events in all of human history, the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus were accompanied with an earthquake. I will shake the earth. Not only that, he said he'd shake the sea. There are two occasions when Jesus Christ was in the presence of the sea that it raged, a shaking of the sea. I'm not going to turn there. You can look at it on your own clock. I'll just tell you about it in the interest of time. But in Matthew 8, 23 through 27, this is when Jesus was on the ship with the disciples and the waves were roaring and the water was getting up in the ship and they were afraid they were going to drown. He was down below taking a nap. And they said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Why sleepest thou? And he awoke, rebuked the winds and the waves, and there was a calm. And they worshipped him, saying, Even the winds and the sea obey him. But there was a shaking of the seas. The other event is reported in Matthew 14, 22 through 23, 33, where Jesus had been up the mountain praying and he'd sent the disciples over to the other side on a ship. And then he came walking to them on the water during the night and the waves were roaring and boisterous. And then when he got into the boat, everything was calm. So that's Matthew 14, 22 through 23. So we see there was a shaking literally of the seas on two occasions when the desire of all nations came. But then, not only that, but in the Bible, waters and seas represent peoples and nations. And we're going to see that they were shaken too. But let me prove that waters and seas represent peoples and nations. I don't want you to just take my word for it. I'm here to preach the word, not the word of Ben Mott. And so, Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. Boy, we've had a lot of flipping today, haven't we? That's the only way I know how to do it, folks. 
We're teaching Bible this morning. Comparing Scripture with Scripture. That's what I was taught. That's what I do. You know how many churches you get one verse and that's it? You might get another one. Revelation 17, 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And he's going to define these waters in verse 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So these seas and waters represent nations and people. So when he says, I'll shake the sea, there's a shaking of the nations. I can give you more on that one. Turn over to um, Isaiah 17. Isaiah 17, 12. 17, 12. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas. Notice how he compares people to seas. And to the rushing of nations, which it must break a rushing, like the rushing of mighty waters. And the nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters. But the Lord, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off. Then if you'll come over to Psalm 65, I'm just showing you how waters and seas represent nations. Especially when they're in a tumultuous condition, because that's often the condition of nations. In Psalm 65, and verse 7, I preached on this when I did the series in Psalm, 1, Psalm 65, verse 7. It says, He stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of the waves. Watch the continuation of thought. And the tumult of the people. So have I made the case that peoples and nations are represented by seas and by waters? And just as he could rebuke the seas to be still, he can rebuke the tumult of the people and silence it. And so, interestingly enough, when we come back to Haggai, we find that not only is there the promise that I will shake the earth and the sea and the dry land, but he said, I will shake all nations. So that the the coming of Jesus Christ not only brought a shake-up in Judaism and in the nation of Israel, and that their whole system of religion was shoved aside, and a new one put in its place, a huge reorganization, if you will. But the whole international scene underwent a shaking with the coming of Jesus Christ. It had international, yea, universal impact. It's tremendous to think about that. Because with the coming of Christ, there was a shaking of the nations. We start over in Matthew chapter 2. Remember I told you that one of the definitions of the word shake is to trouble, to agitate, which means to trouble. <laughs> Look at this. See a shake up starting right away when the desire of all nations comes. Matthew 2, 1 through 3. I love that part of uh, Handel's Messiah. Where uh, One thing I love about Handel's Messiah is it's the King James Bible set to music. Yes. You can't beat the text, people. Yes. And if you, I know some people don't like Handel's Messiah. You've got to let it get into you. That's right. If you ever open up and let it get into you, you'll like it. Um, it's, it, it just really is a moving piece of music. And I love that where he's singing Haggai chapter 2. And I will shake. You know, he, he sings it like it is. And I will shake all nations, the sea, the dry land. Man, I love that. That turns my crank because you're singing the Word of God and you're singing it, the story, like it is. You can hear when they, when they sing Isaiah 53 and the, and the suffering of Jesus, the melancholy comes out in the alto. Or the, uh, uh, what's, that, what's that part? It's between soprano and alto, and I can't think of the name of it. The contralto. You can hear the melancholy. And then when they get to the resurrection, you can hear the triumph yeah, yeah. in the music. The music fits the message. The message fits the music. But anyway... Enough preaching on the wonders of Handel's Messiah. Matthew chapter 2. 
And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. He was shaken. I will shake all nations. He was shaken. And all Jerusalem with him. And then Jesus Christ engages in his ministry, dies, is resurrected, ascends back into heaven, sends his gospel out to the four corners of the earth. And they go out preaching the gospel everywhere. And here's the effect. Acts chapter 17, verse 6. Paul and Silas are at Thessalonica. And they're seized. And they found, no, no, they were looking for them. And they were trying to find them. And we read in Acts 17, 6, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These men, watch it now, that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Those words are worth noting. We'll cite those more than once as we are talking about this passage in Haggai. You talk about a shakeup. Let me tell you, when the world is turned upside down, I call that a shaking. Do you? I mean a shaking. I will shake all nations. And indeed, after the coming of Christ, there was a shaking of the nations and a dashing of them into pieces in that the chain of world empires culminating in Rome. I mean, you had Egypt, and after that you had Assyria. And after that, you had Babylon, which was in power when Daniel saw the Colossus in chapter 2. And after that, you've got Persia. And after that, you've got Greece. And after that, you've got Rome. And after that, you've got uh, 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 what happened. Rome literally dashed to pieces. Fell apart. Yeah, praise the Lord. It fell apart. And man has been trying to put it back together ever since. And to date, without success. What do you think the Holy Roman Empire was all about? What do you think Charlemagne was trying to do? Put it back together. The Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman. It was was an attempt to put that thing back together. What do you think Hitler was trying to do in the Third Reich? He was trying to restore the Holy Roman Empire, which was an effort to restore Rome. Didn't work. Do you know what czar means? The former head of Russia? It means Caesar. You know what the word Kaiser means? In German, it means Caesar. This attempt on the part of man to restore and recapture the glory that was Rome has been unsuccessful. It will be successful for a short while before the end, when Satan is loosed. But until then, effort after effort in futility... Because it was dashed to pieces, just like we read in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, when he set up this kingdom, he said it would break in pieces the other kingdoms. Daniel 2.44, how did he put it? 2.44, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, and I'll, I'll show you that, I'll show you that, it's really, really neat which shall never be destroyed in a kingdom which shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. Psalm chapter 2, God promised this to Jesus Christ. This is one of the effects of his ascension ministry. I can show this to you. Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2 is a prophecy of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The king, the heathen rage, the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth gather themselves together, the rulers of the earth. That's talking about the leaders of the Jews and of Rome gathered together to do whatever God's hand determined to be done, which was fulfilled in the crucifixion of Christ. Then after Jesus is crucified, God raises him from the dead and he ascends into heaven and seated at the right hand of God as we read in verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. That sends Handel's Messiah as well. That's a resurrection according to Acts 13. Ask of me, God says to his risen and exalted son, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession, and thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And that's just what he's been doing since he's been on that throne up there, reigning, putting all enemies under his feet until he puts the last enemy, which is death. (laughs) Rome fell. Who broke it apart? Jesus did. (laughs) Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. 
His coming had an international impact. Let me say it again, a universal impact, because we're going to see that this shaking not only pertained to the realms of the earth, which we see, but to heaven itself, there's a shake up in heaven. We'll see that as we get on. I don't know if we'll get it to today. We may touch on it. In Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 and 27, I love this. Jesus says, He that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. You mean Jesus is going to give me power over the nations? Yes. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter. They shall be broken to shivers even as I will receive of my Father. No, that's past tense. Received of my Father. You see, he's already received his rod of iron rule to break in pieces the nations, and he's done it. But bear in mind, before the end, Satan will be loosed and allowed to put it back together for a short while. And then, when he dashes it again, I'll get to be part of the action. (laughs) That's exciting, isn't it? That I'll I'll get to dash the United Nations to pieces. I think that's exciting. (laughs) Mm. You know, if President Trump can succeed in just putting some dents in this one world government movement, just put a stall on it. You know what I see in that? I see President Trump as just being a part of Jesus' rod of iron. Setting it back. Setting it back. So I give the glory to Jesus, not to Donald Trump. (laughs) But he prophesied not only that he would shake the earth, the sea, the dry land, and all nations, which he did, indeed. And has been doing. But he would shake also heaven. My goodness, what is that? Well, we'll touch on it here. I think we can do this. Come to Matthew 24. And let's look at verse 29. I'll shake heaven. Matthew 24, 29. Jesus is prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem. And he's just talked about it. And he says there in verse um, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, that's talking about the tribulation at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Luke comments on this same passage the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And he connects it with the upheaval that would occur among all nations. In Luke chapter 21, 25 and 26, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, which can refer to the nations and the peoples as well as we've seen. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So we've got this shaking of the powers of heaven and we've also got this upheaval among the nations. There's a connection as I purpose to show you. One of the things that Jesus Christ did, let me just just take a breath because I'm going to... Just take a breath because we're going to dig down deeper here. And I know we've already given you a thing or two to think about. So just take a mental breather. I need to think of something funny to say to give you some economic relief, but right now I don't have anything funny in my head to tell you. So anyway. Colossians chapter 2, that's why I do that sometimes. I do it for what they call comic relief, just to give your brain a rest, so... If you turn over to Colossians chapter 2, you find something that happened in connection with the death of Jesus Christ. 
the death of the desire of all nations that would have such an earth, such a universally shattering cataclysmic effect. In Colossians 2, 14 and 15, talking about Jesus on the cross, that he was blotting out the handwritings of ordinances that was against us. That's taken Moses' law out of the way, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. He took that whole system and nailed it to his cross. Legally, Moses' law ends when Jesus says, it is finished. Experientially, it's over in 70 A.D. when the whole system is decimated. And the temple is knocked down to the ground without one stone left upon another. But legally, it stops here at the cross. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. But notice something connected with the end of the Mosaic system. And having spoiled principalities and powers. That's the organization of the governments of this world. Principalities and powers. But not only is that true with regard to the the world we see, the nations we see, but it's also true with the realms we don't see because the Bible teaches us that Satan's kingdom is organized into principalities and powers. So this is letting us know that with the death of Christ on the cross, there was a spoiling of Satan's kingdom. And with the spoiling of Satan's kingdom, there's a spoiling of the kingdoms of this earth. And again, God willing, I don't think I'll get to it today, but we'll develop this out further. It's really exciting. But blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, or can you tell I'm excited, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, first of all, let's define the word spoil. To spoil means to strip or despoil a dead or helpless person, especially to strip a defeated or slain enemy of arms and armor. So the defenses of Satan's kingdom were spoiled. He was robbed. Interesting thing, and again, this is a little bit of a side note, but I think it bears bringing out. I want to give you two verses about the spoiling of Satan's kingdom, the spoiling of the principalities and powers that I think is interesting. I've used this for years, and I think it's a powerful and unassailable argument. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse uh, 27, you know, you have that passage in Revelation 20 about the binding of Satan. The angel comes down with a great chain and binds him and shuts him up in the bottomless pit. You know, most people think that hasn't happened yet. They don't think Satan's been bound yet. I'm going to show you he has. We just read over there in Colossians 3, 16, 15, that he has spoiled. Having spoiled, that's present perfect tense. This is a done deal. Having spoiled principalities and powers. Then you come to verse 27. No man can enter into a strong man's house. And, and he's talking here about Satan and overcoming Satan. That's the context of the discussion. And he just said, no man can enter into a strong man's house, that strong man is the devil, and spoil his goods. And has he spoiled Satan's goods? According to Colossians, he has. But he can't do that except he will first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Sounds like the devil had to be bound to spoil his house. That's happened, people. Satan has been bound. It was done in connection with the first coming of Christ. The citation is Mark 3.27. Did I say Matthew? I'm sorry. Mark. Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing that to my attention. It's Mark 3.27. You can't spoil his house. You first bind him. That's got to take place first. Then come over to Luke chapter 11. I've used that for years in an effort to overthrow premillennialism, dispensationalism. Luke 11, 21 and 22. When a strong man armed... Luke eleven twenty one and 22. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him, here's Jesus Christ, the stronger than the devil, and overcome him, he taketh from, his all, from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. He has spoiled principalities and powers. And spoiling an enemy greatly hinders his ability to launch a counterattack 
And that explains why Satan has not been successful for nearly 2,000 years of reassembling the glory that was Rome. And like I say, this not only refers to earthly principalities and powers, but also to the spiritual principalities and powers that animate them. When you look at the governments of this earth, you look behind them, You find spiritual unseen powers, principalities and powers that animate them, which explains the greed and the corruption and the rapacity of so many nations in this earth. Because the devil's behind it. Look at Ephesians 6 and verse 13. Ephesians 6, 13. 6, 13. Pardon me, it's verse 12 is what I want. I'm sorry. I've got it wrong in the notes. It's verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. See, the, 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 these, are, these are principalities and powers we don't see. And they were shaken. They were spoiled. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there you got it. There's the unseen spiritual wickedness organized in powers, principalities and powers that Christ spoiled. Then Daniel chapter 10 proves to us that there are unseen beings that animate Satan's empires. Daniel chapter 10, 13. This is an angel that's been sent to Daniel with a message. And he says to this, to Daniel, verse 13, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in twenty days. I'm talking about an angel. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, that's one of God's angels, came to help me, and I remain there with the kings of Persia. Then come on down to verse 20. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I'm gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. So there's all kind of wars going on in the unseen realm you and I don't see. All kind of things happening. But when Jesus came, the spiritual principalities and powers, the spiritual wickedness in the high places, called by Jesus the powers of heaven, were shaken. Were shaken. And that's why Satan's whole world empire program was shaken and dissolved. Let me give you this much, and then I think I will be done. I've given you so much, I know. This is a heavy, heavy stuff. But I think, I think I can get this. With the coming of Christ, there was a shake-up in the realm of Satan's kingdom that reached all the way to heaven. I'll give you two verses to show this. John chapter 12. When God shook Satan's kingdom, that shaking went all the way into heaven. There was a big shake-up, a big reorganization. Things changed in the re- scene of the re- in the realm of what we see and in the realm of what we don't see. In John twelve thirty one and thirty two, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Who's the prince of this world, people? Satan. Satan, Satan was going to be cast out of some place in connection with the death of Christ. And if I, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now come to Revelation chapter 12. Let's see the shakeup. Cast out. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12, 5 through 10. And she brought forth a man-child. That's Jesus. Who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's Jesus. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. There's the ascension of Christ after his death, burial, and resurrection. And the woman, this is the church, fled into the wilderness where she hath the place prepared of God, and that they should feed her a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And remember Jesus said immediately after the tribulation of those days, the destruction of Jerusalem, there would be a shakeup of the powers of heaven. And there was war in heaven. Michael, we found that he's on our side. <laughs> he, he defends the church. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore 
in heaven. He was cast out of heaven with no more access. And the great dragon was cast out. And that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. There was a shake-up. The powers of heaven were shaken. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Prior to the coming of Christ in this world, Satan could gain access to heaven itself to accuse us before God. He did, that wasn't his permanent dwelling. But he had access there, and he could go up there, and he could accuse us, he and his angels, before our God. He can't do that anymore. Amen. Because the law that condemned us, that he could point to, to accuse us, has been fulfilled and set aside, no charge to be laid. Amen. He can still accuse us and our consciences, and he does, but that accusation does not transfer to God in heaven. You just remember that, that because your conscience accuses you, that doesn't mean your God is dealing with you that way. Satan, the accuser of our brethren, has been cast down. That's one power of heaven that's no longer there. It was shaken out of the place. <laughs> yes, praise God. I told you, reorganization. I mean, the whole legal system's been shaken up. And the chief prosecuting attorney can't even get in the courtroom. Hallelujah! There's been a shake-up. Now, if that doesn't make you happy, I don't know how to do it. Don't you love it when we, can we surface up out all this deep stuff and we got some simple little something that makes us bring smiles on our faces. And if that doesn't make you rejoice, you're dead! You got that right. To what's going on here. I know I waxed eloquent with that, but that's worth waxing eloquent over. <laughs> but did you know that when Jerusalem was in the process of being destroyed, there was things going on in the heavens? I want to read something Josephus did, said, and we'll be done with this. Consider the shaking of heavens during the destruction of Jerusalem. I mean, it started with the crucifixion of Christ. That thing just came on and came on until Judaism was completely swept out of the way. The Roman Empire dashed in pieces, and now the rest of history, we're experiencing the aftershocks of the great shakeup. <laughs> Consider the shaking of heavens during the destruction of Jerusalem, as reported by the Jewish historian Josephus. Besides these, a few days after that feast, on the one and twentieth day of the month, Artemisius, Artemisius, I think it's the pronunciation, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those that saw it and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sunsetting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about the clouds and surrounding the cities. Behold, I will shake not only the earth, all, but heaven also. There was a major shake-up in the realm of the seen and unseen, when the desire of all nations came. Well, God willing, we'll look further next time to how, with the destruction of Jerusalem, the pagan world empire was overthrown. With the dismantling of the Mosaic system of service was the dismantling of Satan's world empire program. And investigate further the great shake-up when the desire of all nations came. I, I hope you got something out of that this morning. I... I find it rather interesting. Thank you. God bless.